to the left. Yeah. Start to the my oh. left. This one. Right. Cool. Cool. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Cardio. And I'm Alex Werner, and we are both senior biomedical engineering students at San Jose State University. So today we'll be going over a couple different things. Um, the biomedical my motivation, um, background FDA considerations, design of experiment methods, results, um, major findings, a brief cost analysis, future work and acknowledgements. So in terms of uh, the biomedical motivation for our system, we are working on a cooling system uh, to help prevent skin and nail toxicity. Sorry about the images if you're touchy for medical images. Um, so during chemotherapy, um, IV drugs are injected into the body over a four to six hour period. Um, these drugs can cause adverse side effects in the skin, nails, and hair in terms of uh, alopecia. So in order to tackle this problem, cryotherapy has been used um, to prevent alopecia. Um, and there are several studies that show that those are beneficial. And there are current studies that are working um, to explore further the benefits of cryotherapy, um, including... Uh, prevention of peripheral neuropathy, um, as well as the skin and nail problems associated with chemotherapy. Um, so in terms of cryotherapy, uh, when applying um, a cooling to the skin, it induces vasoconstriction, um, and this will effectively limit the amount of chemotherapy drugs that enter those areas. And um, in cancer, typically, you don't need uh, the IV drugs to be present in the hands, feet, or head, unless it's brain cancer, obviously. Um, or, and skin cancer would be another exception to the rule. Um, so we don't worry as much about not having chemo drugs in those areas. They'll still stay in the areas that they really need to be in. Um, so uh, also, according to literature values, um, 18 degrees Celsius or lower has been shown to be the ideal temperature. Um, to induce the vasoconstriction required to prevent hair loss. So we expect that a similar temperature would be preferable for the hands and feet as well. Um, in terms of thermoelectric coolers, um, they basically use, uh, they have two sides here. Oh, I guess the laser printer doesn't work on there. But um, they have two sides and they are filled with a series of PNN type <coughs> semiconductors and a voltage is run through the TEC. Um, and that results in a cool side and a hot side. So the cool side is mostly what we're looking at, but we also have to find a way to um, get rid of that residual heat that's coming off of the top. Um, so Eric will talk about the market analysis. Yeah, so just uh, another part of our background was assessing the current um, forms of, of cooling that uh, chemo patients are, are utilizing. Uh, one is the penguin ice pack, ice cap, uh, which is basically just ice packs that they have to wrap around their head. Uh, very inefficient as they have to be uh, switched out every 20 minutes, which is you know kind of cumbersome as we want, really want to keep that, that cooling consistent throughout the entirety of their uh, chemo treatment. Uh, the Dini cap is uh, a system that utilizes uh, coolant, uh, cooled in this tank, as you can see in the middle right here, uh, that feeds through a, a system into these silicone caps, the green and blue ones right here. Uh, there's an intermediate wool layer that goes over the silicone cap, and then a neoprene layer, which has a boa, sh um, boa I mean, uh, ratcheting system uh, that cinches it down. Uh, this is to ensure uh, good contact across the entirety of the scalp, as they can't have these hot pockets that you know would um, you know prevent or they they get. Incomplete cooling uh, uh, across the scalp. Um, Twenty-six hundred dollars is where it caps off for patients uh, for use. It's not it's not covered by insurance. Um, also, we got to visit a, a, cl a clinic that um, you know an infusion center that uh, the nurses kind of gave me some insight into kind of like the ins and outs. Uh, the chemo patients like often opt out of this uh, treatment just because it's really co uh, too cold for them, really uncomfortable. Um, it feeds uh, coolant at zero degrees Celsius, so that's really uncomfortable for, the, for them. So 
uh, that's something we considered in our design. Yeah, it's also kind of expensive as well um, as you're just renting the system for that that twenty six hundred dollars. Um, and as you can see as well, like this system takes up a really large um, footprint in terms of area of usage that the clinics really really need um, for patients and the, and their equipment. Oops. Yeah, so the Dignity Cap is a class 2 medical device, and these are some of the standards that we considered, uh, that we found from their 510K, um, that we'd have to consider if this uh, product was uh, to be brought further along. <clears throat> so our, des our design of experiment, um, we wanted to test, obviously, temperature of uh, a synthesized hydrogel that we're using as for our test system, as well as temperature distribution. Um, just to maximize the, the efficiency of our system and to kind of get an idea of how many thermal electric coolers we would need. We we're also considering electrical properties, which is voltage and current that we're delivering to the, to the TDC uh, for efficiency of that system. Uh, the electrical engineers of our, of our team uh, were in charge of that, the power system and how uh, it ran efficiently. <clears throat> So, like I said, we're considering spacing of TECs, uh, also the materials uh, as an intermediate layer between the scalp and the TECs. We wanted an electrically insulating and a thermally conducting material um, to ensure you know, safety from the electrical components of the system, as well as uh, efficient cooling uh, throughout the entirety of the scalp. <clears throat> we also considered uh, types of cooling. Now, this is on top of this, the system. Um, so, the TEC has a cold layer and a hot layer. So we have to remove that hot layer efficiently to ensure that the TEC works at its uh, maximum capacity. If it can't remove that heat, then it, the polarity reverses and it starts heating instead of cooling. So we definitely don't want that. Uh, so we considered active and passive cooling that's with and without fans on top of the heat sinks. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. So we had three tiers for our methods. Uh, tier one was basically set up, get, uh, getting all, all our materials considered, and uh, together we synthesized our tissue mimicking hydrogel. Uh, we verified that TECs were performing to their uh, design specs. Uh, the next tier was uh, the preliminary testing, which was verifying our hydrogel, uh, making sure it, we could keep it at a constant uh, surface skin temperature, which we found to be around 34 degrees Celsius. And we wanted to make sure that we could cool the hydrogel uh, initially. Um, we put the TECs on, directly on the hydrogel and measured temperature under with the thermal, thermal couples, uh, as well as uh, different materials that we'll get into, different uh, intermediate level materials. <clears throat> so once we did preliminary testing, we were able to kind of refine our test. Uh, we synthesized another hydrogel and uh, also adjusted the amount of PGS uh, material and thicknesses that we wanted and kind of got a better idea of, of that. Okay, so in terms of uh, what we actually performed, um, this is a picture of our hydrogel synthesis. Um, it was an existing synthesis uh, that we used um, that had uh, tissue mimicking, especially skin mimicking properties. Um, so we found that in a paper and we synthesized the hydrogel. Um, and basically our system consisted of a submersible water heater um, that would heat the water and bring it up through a water pump um, through a splitter into tubes that were embedded in the hydrogel and then circle it back into the pump. Um, the, the water pump itself was actually connected to an Arduino system as well. Um, so this is our our Arduino setup. So we have the Arduino connected to a relay board, um, and then there's actually two volt, two power sources as well um, for that. And that is to simulate pulsatile blood flow um, through the hydrogel. So this is a setup of more of our system, uh, what it actually looked like. So we had the submersible water heater, the water um, power supply, and uh, this was actually our hydrogel, oops, sorry. This was our hydrogel with, um, so there's multiple layers that we tested. So we have the hydrogel with the tubes running through it. We have the pyrolytic graphite sheets on top of that. Um, and the sensors are between the pyrolytic graphite and the hydrogel. So it's basically would be like on the surface of the skin. Um, and then on top of that, we had the neoprene with the thermoelectric coolers 
and the heat sinks. And there were squares cut out in the neoprene so that basically the TEC is sitting directly on top of the pyrolytic graphite. So this is kind of a close up of what our, our latest model looked like. So you have the TEC on the bottom here. Sorry, my laser pointing doesn't really work very well on this guy. It does a little bit. So we have the TEC down here. This is the heat sink and this is the fan used for active cooling with the neoprene here. Um, this is kind of what our hydrogel looked like. Um, and those were the temperature sensors that we used as well. They're flat, so that made it a little bit better than our initial ones. Um, this is a schematic of uh, the last test that we did with um, the three thermoelectric coolers. We were kind of uh, playing around with what would give us the best temperature distribution because we really want equal temperature distribution as much as possible across um, the surface of the skin. And we also need to get that temperature to be 18 degrees Celsius or lower. So um, we had some that were directly under the TECs and other temperature sensors at different spots. Okay. So with the help of Dr. Goslin uh, from the ME department, we were able to kind of get an idea of how, how well we could distribute cooling um, <clears throat> with this uh, discretization scheme that uh, she helped us, or she uh, designed for us, and then we kind of were able to play with the, um, the values a little bit here. So this slope, Oh, this doesn't work. But the slopes uh, represent a relationship between the Q of the Q uh, cooling power of the TEC and the properties of the pyrolytic graphite. So the temperature going through, uh, how well it's able to travel through the, the graphite. And the graphite values that we considered was the thermal conductivity as well as the area that it, the cooling was traveling. So as we increased the thickness, we found that, um, well, first of all, this rep each line represents uh, a different thickness of uh, pyrolytic graphite. <clears throat> so as we increase the thickness of the graphite as they're manufactured, the thermal conductivity actually goes down. So what we uh, kind of determined was we could stack these uh, layers and get better thermal distribution. So we ended up at this blue line. As you can see, we're kind of around 18 degrees Celsius, which is our, our target temperature. Uh, this was the most uh, cost-efficient um, pyrolytic graphite, and we were able to play with it around with the uh, the values to get like how many we wanted, and we wanted uh, three three layers of PGS. <clears throat> so our first uh, physical test was just verifying the hydrogel. Like like I explained earlier, we put two temperature sensors on the hydrogel uh, to make sure that we were able to keep the uh, the surface temperature at 34 degrees, and as you can see, we were able to do that. I think the, uh, yeah, they're about uh, five inches apart, each TEC, or each uh, thermal, thermal sensor. <clears throat> so we wanted to compare the hydrogel and like how, how well it was representing an actual, you know, our skin properties. So that's what we did here. Uh, we found there to be a 23% error uh, between the hydrogel and the arm. Uh, basically what we did here was take two similar ice packs, put sensors on each one, uh, uh, equal space apart and you know measure the, the temperature so the orange and red are from my arm and the blue and green are from the hydrogel so as you can see uh, it's a lot harder for us to to cool the hydrogel as it didn't adjust with cooling as much um, because we don't actually the, have the changing of the no, vessels the vessels right. are staying the, the same yeah, so crazy. so that's something we had to consider as well Okay, so then we went on um, to continue testing uh, with the hydrogel and the thermoelectric coolers. Um, so this, uh, this test here is with two thermoelectric coolers um, and they were spaced 10 centimeters apart. Um, and this is without any pyrolytic graphite. So um, this, this top line here, I'm sorry, I keep going to use the laser pointer, it's not working. <laughs> this top line here is uh, the temperature sensor that's halfway in between. And as you can see, we really didn't see any change in temperature there because we don't have any material to distribute the cooling. Um, however, under both the TECs, we got down um, to below 18 degrees Celsius, so that was promising. Um, for our next one, we have um, 
the hydrogel, it's the same one as the last one, but we have the pyrolytic graphite this time. So um, as you can see, these are, uh, it's the same spacing in between the 10 centimeters um, with the temperature sensor right directly in between those. Um, so we did get cooling um, in between the TECs. It wasn't quite as low as we wanted to, um, but I think with some adjustments with TECs, um, like the model number, I think that we could probably get down to that point. So, um, Our next one was with the one that I talked about a little bit previously with the three TECs. Um, and with that, the spacing, they were still spaced, the two TECs were spaced 10 centimeters apart, but there was a TEC on the bottom that was a little bit closer. Um, so we did see um, actually really excellent uh, temperature distribution um, in the ones that were a little bit closer. Um, and lastly, we have, um, we did do just some testing. This could not be included in anything um, actually submitted, but uh, we did do testing with the, t the TECs just on the forearm, um, just to see, kind of get an idea of what we were looking at. And we actually got pretty good results here. We were able to get down um, below 18 degrees Celsius in um, both of those areas. And what was interesting actually, because it was on the forearm, we had one here and one here. The lower one did get um, colder by a couple degrees than, than the upper one. So um, that is something that we'll have to factor in later as well. So we did determine that the hydrogel was uh, a good test to, uh, for our system, just with that, that error that we had to consider. Uh, we also considered varying thicknesses of PGS sheets and like I said, we arrived at the 25 micrometer sheet, which is the 1600 watts per meter Kelvin. Uh, just as a reference, uh, aluminum, which is considered a very high thermal thermally conductive material, is 200 watts per meter Kelvin. So significantly, uh, significantly uh, you know, larger. And with the electrically insulating properties, it was a, a good material that we think to use. <clears throat> In our initial test, we were also using power supplies that we're not delivering the right amount of current that we wanted. Uh, so we had to adjust our tests um, to, with, to use a boost converter that we just got DC current directly from the wall. Uh, that was very beneficial as we were able to step up or step down uh, necessary voltage for our multiple TEC tests, uh, as well as uh, it delivered the, the right amount of current that we needed. So we were able to get a better idea of how the TECs actually performed. <coughs> So yeah, like I said, we determined that we were able to cool the, the hydrogel to a certain point uh, within that, that air. Um, we also tested, uh, like Alex mentioned earlier, TECs directly on the hydrogel, which we were able to get down to 18 degrees Celsius, uh, as well as with the PGS layers. So directly under the TECs, we were able to get down below uh, 18 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and we did determine that active cooling was the best way to remove the heat from uh, the hot side of the TECs, as uh, you know, we didn't want that reverse polarity, just way too much heat to, to have on the top of the head. <clears throat> so we did uh, figure, uh, conclude that we wanted to use more layers of the 25 micrometer thickness. Um, we either want to use a large amount of small TECs, uh, just as a reference, the ones that we were using had a QC of 33, whereas high powered um, TECs have like 133 watts, so that's something we can consider. We can either use a bunch of the smaller ones or a bunch of the higher power ones. <clears throat> and like I said, we did test on our forearm and uh, found that we were able to get really close to the temperature that we wanted in the middle of the two TECs at 20 degrees Celsius and under, we were able to get below our threshold at 16 degrees Celsius. So just a really brief cost analysis. Um, so this is a breakdown of the cost of each of the things that were used um, in the prototype materials. Um, so the total cost for the system that's including the PCB and um, power supply and everything else uh, would be about, you know, just under $700, um, which is still, you know, better than the $2,600. You'd have to factor in manufacturing costs as well. Um, and yeah, and personnel, yeah. that kind of thing. We so, can definitely play with that number though a little bit to, to optimize the system. And if you, were, if you were manufacturing it as well, like the cost of these comes down significantly when you're buying in bulk. So there's that. Um, 
And this was just a list of justifications um, as to why we went with each uh, different model that we chose. Um, but we pretty much explained that in the rest of the presentation. Um, in terms of future work, we did submit a um, abstract to the BMES uh, national conference. So we might be doing some work on this over the summer as well and continue working with the EE students. Um, so right now we are working on um, finishing a CAD model for the CAP to be 3D printed. Um, and that's basically so that we have a way to secure all of the pyrolytic graphite sheets as well as the neoprene, which functions to um, insulate, keep the cold in and the hot on the hot side. Um, so that, and we could also fix the, the TECs to that cap as well. Um, so we might play around again with uh, different um, models of TECs. We had a high performance one, but we couldn't supply enough power to it without the PCB. So um, hopefully when the PCB comes in, we'll be able to test that as well. Um, as Eric stated, the, the ability of, to remove the heat, which is the QC, um, that's the amount of heat that can be removed by the TEC, is significantly higher. So we would be able to cool, if we used a higher performance TEC, we'd be able to cool faster and more effectively at lower voltage and amperage, um, which is nice for efficiency of the system. Um, we also, um, for our purposes, we're probably going to stick with smaller TECs and more of them, um, but we probably will up, up the power a little bit to a higher performing one. Um, we also would like to work on improving the heatsink design, which could probably be a project in and of itself um, just for heat removal. Um, as it's a little bit bulky, um, it doesn't, it's not going to look very nice sitting on the head. Um, the fans make a small amount of noise, not enough to be um, problematic, but it's more annoying than anything else. So, uh, yeah, if we could find a way, there's certain heat sinks that um, are actually fanned outwards that we might be able to pull off passive cooling without the fan. Um, so, yeah, improve the heat sink design so it's lighter and less bulky. Um, and in terms of further testing that could be done would be um, the IR sensitive uh, camera for IR thermography to get a temperature profile. Um, because we didn't have the PCB, we couldn't finish the prototype. Um, so we didn't really see the point of doing that at this point, but um, that's something that we'll probably do over the summer. And our last uh, thing would be to complete the entire system with the cap, gloves, and booties. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. And we'd just like to thank our project advisor, uh, Dr. Alessandro Golfiore, as well as Dr. Mohamed Badawi, who was our electrical engineering advisor, uh, Dr. Goslin for her help with the MATLAB simulation, uh, Dr. John Lee for the uh, supplying of the hydrogel materials, as well as Randy Kirtner from the chemistry department, uh, Dr. Eric Bobo, our senior project professor, as well as William Slocum. And I will be happy to take any questions. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it just, oh, it's pretty cool. Uh, why? I'm just kind of, did, did you test compared to just putting like an ice pack on your arm? Mm -hmm. you, yeah. I think yeah, I was in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How how did that? Can you remind me? Yeah. So there was a 23 percent difference. I, I don't know if it's exactly relative error. That I should be calling this this yeah, uh, difference. Where is it? Here. There it is. Yeah, yeah, that's where I got. Yeah, so we just t had two on my arm and then two as well on the hydrogel, uh, same distance with similar um, ice Okay, packs. so T one arm is. Oh, that's just a, our labeling purposes oh, because we had uh, four different sensors. Okay. Um, so yeah, it was just. Uh, <clears throat> T one was further away from my body. T two was closer. Similar to the hydrogel, T1 okay. was further away from the inlet. So this is the results from an ice, sorry, ice pack Yes. Is cold, I guess, at like 15 or so, is that? Yeah, yeah, so or, 15 is right around down here. Yeah. So um, you're getting colder than an ice pack, or? We can get about no, the same. The, well, we, we did measure the, the ice packs uh, before, and they were around 3 degrees Celsius. Okay, because then you're going to say, for like an ice pack, you say, yeah, like, don't put it directly on your skin, because mm -hmm. um, it can raise it. Oh, your really? So uh, generally, they say, yeah. put, like, put it on like, a cloth or something. So uh, I was kind of curious. Yeah, like, it was uh, directly on the skin. So what's the benefit of doing your system versus just putting an ice pack? 
honestly. Okay. I can, um, I can say it yeah. if you want. So basically, um, with ice packs, so there's a couple of things. They have to super cool them. So they, they do that via nitrogen, actually. So it's kind of a process, and they have to bring it in with the ice chest. And then they have to change it out about every 20 to 30 minutes, and the chemo sessions last four to six hours. So okay. that's a lot of changing it in and out, and a lot of different <laughs> ice packs. Um, and, and again, it, one of the biggest um, concerns for the clinics was the amount of space that's taken up, right? They didn't even want to get an ice machine because they thought it took up so much space. So they had the people at Stanford were actually having patients bring in coolers of ice, which when you're already going through chemotherapy, it's like, <clears throat> that's another whole big thing. So our goal was to try and reduce the size of the system. Um, I'm sure yeah. I'm probably forgetting something. Uh, also, well. uh, our system takes into account uh, thermal sensing or uh, like yeah, constant ther thermal uh, readings mm -hmm. input that we can deliver constant and you know uh, reliable cooling uh, to the patient. Mm -hmm. So, so they definitely are more aware and you know. Yeah, because we're working with two EE students as well. So they've been working on the the PCB printed circuit board as well as um, the temperature sensing. So there's a feedback loop um, with the temperature sensors in the cap um, that will adjust the voltage as necessary for the cooling. Okay. Yeah. So how, how do these feel? How cold do they feel? Okay. For example, 18 yeah. degrees. That's what like Southern California. 64.4 <laughs> okay. uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah. So that's like yeah. ocean temperature. Yeah. yeah. So it's like it's, six, it's, seven, it's in very, it's like a cooler room, you know, indoor yeah. conditioning. So yeah, one of our goals too is, um, he said the Dignicap, they cool the liquid down to like zero, 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 yeah, zero yeah. degrees yeah. Celsius. So, so they have sensors in their caps, but it's more for safety. Okay. It's not really like a feedback where they're adjusting the temperature of the coolant. That's where ours is, is definitely different. Okay. And it's, it's actually really comfortable. Uh, the TECs with the, the, pi, the PGS layers, um, it's a lot more manageable. If you just, I, I can't really touch it for more than five seconds, uh, the cold side of the TEC. Without the, the, without the PGS, yeah. Okay. And how for a cap, I mean, for example, I've got a lot of hair here. Mm -hmm. How would it work? Would this be insulating me from the effectiveness of? Is that definitely another load that we have to consider, uh, that we have to cool through. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we, we definitely noticed like, you know, even the smallest change of thickness and material that we would add onto the system would drastically uh, affect our, our cooling capability. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. the points to keep your hair, you don't want to like, right. shave it off, just use yeah. so yeah. the system. So right. Yeah. <laughs> Something interesting that um, the Dini Cap users have to do is actually wet their hair mm -hmm. before they um, before they get the treatment and then kind of put it all in in the cap. So they have to like kind of fold it in, mm -hmm. which should have gotten a more clear answer well, about why. This is waterproof, that. so what? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I assume it just it helps with the, the cooling, like, yeah. kind of like lowers the temperature down, so it's kind of easier for them to, to, to cool. And we did notice that there was a slight um, temperature difference in terms of, like, the top of the hair versus the actual. So the skin temperature was more, th like, 34. Um, <laughs> when you're looking at the hair and the scalp, and, with hair on it, obviously, um, that would be closer to like 30 to 32 degrees. Okay. Um, so there will be amount of insulation, but then there's also the four degrees that you don't have to cool quite as much. So you have to cool through more. So I think it'll probably end up evening out. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, um, if we end up, you know, pursuing this more over the summer, we'd probably um, go through and do an IRB so that we could do more testing on humans that was actually legal. <laughs> yeah. And you yeah. can test on him when you just can't record it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we, so. we try to be safe about it. Yeah. yeah. As best we could. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Nice work. Cool. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Well, Thanks for bearing with well. everyone. I know it's yeah. kind of a long Thanks day for, for, for you guys. <laughs> One more day of presentation for the semester. <laughs>
a long time. <laughs> Where is the record button? This one? The silver one, yeah.